Okay folks, I think we'll make a start. Uh, thank you all for coming, it's great to have so many people here. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Matthew Jaron, I'm the Museum Curator here at the University uh, and we're absolutely delighted to uh, welcome uh, David Annand uh, for this special evening tonight. Um, so uh, we kind of, some of you I think may have come back in 2019 when we had a, a fantastic uh, uh, public art conference, sort of full day event where we had a lot of different artists speaking and David came and spoke at that and gave an absolutely terrific talk. Uh, and ever since then we've really wanted to have an excuse to kind of bring him back to talk further. Uh, and we currently have, as you may have already seen, our exhibition still moving outside in the terra foyer, uh, all around motion. Uh, and we've included the, uh, the maquette that we have for what eventually became the Tumblr Falls uh, statues at the Kingsway West Retail Park. Um, and so you can have a look at that afterwards if you have time. Uh, but of course that gave us an excuse to invite David to come back and, and give a talk about his work. And so much of, of his work is about uh, you know, capturing motion in one way or another. Um, and uh, as I'm sure you will, you will already be familiar with many of his, his works. Uh, and indeed, you know, I think very often you will see his works and not necessarily know they're by him, uh, but all over the place in Dundee, and if you go to Perth or, or Broth or Montrose and many places further afield and indeed all around the UK and beyond, uh, you'll see David's work. Um, David is of course one of our alumni, he studied at Duncan Jordanson, uh, graduated in 1971 and then did his post diploma in 72, uh, and of course has gone on to a hugely successful career. So we're absolutely delighted to have him with us this evening, and I will dim the lights and hand over to you. Good evening, and thank you so much for coming. It says here. <laughs> I always use a script because you can't be good at everything, and the spoken word is certainly not my chosen medium. What that chosen medium is remains to be decided by AM only. It's okay. If I don't use this script, I will hum and haw and forget where I am and miss out stuff. I was really honoured to be invited by Matthew to give this talk. Artists who work alone have to have like to have their ego massaged now and then and get out into the city. So get on with it, it says here. <laughs> uh, I've taken to heart the title of the exhibition, Still Moving, and I will use this as like a Presbyterian minister uses a, a text. In 2007, I won a commission to make a sculpture in the grounds of the Marie Curie Centre in Knock Road in Belfast using this maquette. That went fine, and then I I had promised to commission a poet to get some apposite words inscribed on the surface of the seating area. By using poets, I get added value from superior intellects and academics, and no mistake, I am very far from a creative academic. So I went for the Island of Ireland's poets database. We all know the Irish are the best poets, both living and dead, and as you can imagine, it was labyrinthine. Hunters and hunters. <laughs> so I thought, I might as well start at the top. I emailed Seamus Heaney's publisher and waited for a response. Next day, Seamus himself phoned me at home and said he would be delighted. I remember that tingling feeling down my back as I walked around the sitting room listening to this wonderful lilting voice encouraging me, and so began a lovely relationship. He sent me draft ideas like this fax and invited the hospice staff to comment and correct, which they did. Now, here was the greatest loving poet in the English language, inviting me and the staff to correct his poem. A lesson in humility and generosity. More facts has arrived with tiny alterations and little anecdotes explaining them. Now, if we zoom into it, we won't have to, it's such a big screen. If we zoom in on this fax, which is fading, I'll read it out. May the 9th, 2007. Dear David, as I was saying, hospice comes to the Latin hospes, meaning both host and guest. And while I'm running the lesson, I might as well add that still is used here as a verb and an adverb at one and the same time. Still yourself, still yourself. Take time, be at rest, enter the circle, and alone a guest. That was after the hospice staff had said, you can't say take your time because the patients don't have any. So he took out the your and left it out, instead of what other verbose poets would have done and found other words to use. He could craft an atmosphere in a poem with the simplest of words. And in other facts, he had made further changes and explained, you see there, a change in line two as well. The word the for the word are. It changes the status of the guest, but I'm still not sure if it's better. Marginally, I believe it is. And after all, marginal is what counts in this kind of action. 
I've always cited the admonition of a senior to a junior civil servant reading a document as applicable, as applicable to the work of art. This is a minor point of major significance. So over to you again. What do you think, Seamus? So I commissioned a fabricator to make a template of the bench and I modelled the fix this fictional lady. I was trying to make something archetypally beautiful. Not sexy, but simply beautiful. She was cast in bronze and mounted on an omega bench of stainless steel with the poem still engraved on it. The patients apparently talked to her and called her the listening lady. The logistics involved in transporting a piece like this were horrendous. However, my fabricator made the omega in two halves, but when we got to the hospice, the doors were too narrow to get into the quadrangle. So we had a crane which lifted the whole thing right over the building and into the quadrangle. Seamus sadly didn't make it to the unveiling, but it was done by one Eamon Holmes, who was actually great. He wandered off uh, around the hospice after the unveiling to chat to patients. He was a gentleman. After still, I went to work again with Seamus on a different three-dimensional birthday card from the residence of Balahi. It was his 70th birthday in his hometown in Northern Ireland. I drove over to Ireland and gave him a truck full of turfs, or peats as they might call them, <coughs> in Scotland, and I brought them home and stacked and sculpted them into a man digging after Seamus's poem. It was cast in bronze and shipped to Balachi, where Seamus unveiled it. He said to, a uh, to me in a phone call, it is a well-stacked androgynous figure, but at least I can say I'm a well-backed stacked man, <laughs> but don't tell the wife. <laughs> <laughs> it stands near the bend in the tomb road, where when he was driving home from a dance, he had to change down through the gears and it popped into his head, Grandfather, Father Seamus. Here I was, here was I rather, uh, at the unveiling, clutching my wee script and sitting next to Seamus Heaney, Nobel Laureate, and uh, peace uh, uh, poet and translator, and Arne, uh, Martin McGuinness, peacemaker and orator. We all had to make speeches, and guess how I began, <laughs> by apologising for using a script. <coughs> As we were sitting there in the front row of, of the crowd, uh, sorry, in front of the, this growing crowd, uh, I told Seamus how I made his head in tufts and tried to fit it onto the figure, but it was too big, so I made a smaller one. I said, looking at this crowd, I should have left the big one on. And did he not go and mention that in his speech? <laughs> After the unveiling, Seamus and his lovely wife, Marie, picked me up at my B&B uh, and he handed me a written copy, a handwritten copy of Digging. Uh, we were driven to the restaurant in Draperstown by his archivist. Does your archivist drive you anywhere? <laughs> <coughs> uh, we had a great night and he dropped me off at b and &B, slightly sozzled. Uh, but we continued to communicate by letters and faxes and emails. And listening to him in a recent documentary on Radio 4, he spoke of an, an artist friend, Derek Hill, who was a terrible name dropper. When Seamus, can he, when Seamus confronted him about this, he replied, Funnily enough, the Queen Mother was telling me that too. <laughs> Every time Seamus went, uh, sent me a letter or a fax, there was a little anecdote in it. So enough name dropping. Uh, uh, so now some movement and action. In 1989 or thereabouts, I was teaching art in St Saviour's High School in Whitfield. Ian White, the landscape architect, uh, contacted me and insisted that I was shortlisted for this commission. I took part in one, and my headmistress gave me unpaid leave to go ahead and make it. She was very keen on the arts and very supportive, <coughs> unlike her predecessor. Uh, my favourite quote from the late Mary Duffy was, Scotland will benefit from David giving up teaching. <laughs> <laughs> that was a double-edged sword from an English teacher who had studied Shakespeare. Uh, and now this is how dear it looked in 1989, and I hate to tell you, but the photographer's here. It's <laughs> managed to get uh, um, Well, I lost the place, man. Um, but they cleared the fence then. Uh, then the hedge grew and grew, but they still cleared it. I was influenced by Mybridge's pictures of animals and people in action, so it could be said that this is a three-dimensional freeze frame of a fallow deer stags leaping out of the technology park. On a minor point of major significance, uh, to quote Seamus, uh, I wanted to make them jumping into the park in answer to the remit of bringing people round to, into the park to see them. But the Scottish Development Agency and their wisdom said we wanted them leaping out and not showing their arses to the public, <laughs> or the passing traffic for that matter. Um, 
So uh, again, this is how they looked at as the hedge grew, but it wasn't maintained, and neither are the deer. Uh, the recently retired public arts officer, John Gray, tried to persuade the owners, but no response, and I don't even know who the owners are. Ian White also designed the garden in the quadrangle of what is now called Swan House. It's the last building on the right of the technology park as you approach the Swallow Roundabout. I designed and built this flight of mute swans and mounted them on a gravel garden. It's meant to be what they call a dry loch. <clears throat> I have no idea what state they're in now, and a lot of the technology parts buildings have uh, gone into disrepair. Violet Jacob of the House of Dunn near Montrose wrote the lyrics to a wonderful song called The Norman, Norlin Wind, set to music by Jim Reed. I won't sing it because my singing will make you cry, and I won't read it all because it will make me cry. But this is the verse that inspired me to use the geese and the, uh, the Montrose Basin. And far aboon the Angus Strass I saw the well geese flee, a lang lang skein of beaten wings with their heads turned towards the sea, and either crying voices trailed a hint them on the air, or wind hey mercy had your wish for a darn listen mare. Shed a tear. <laughs> Poet William Souter wrote some terrific poetry during the Second World War, and the river was about um, the dangerous waters of the Tay at Perth and the fears of war. I call this piece The Dark and Singing Tide, taken from the last line in the poem. Written in 1942, there was a hint of blackouts and certain and uncertainty of the times, and you can feel the cold shiver down the spine in the last few lines. The river. When the murk is o'er the gavels and the clattering brigs are still, a sound comes up through the water, a swirling and a swirl. It's mere old or gladness, and while well, listens to young music, his thought grows cold and clear. He feels the world's glory gang flitting o'er his blood, like the skimmer of the lamplicht on the dark and singing tide. I grew up in Perth, and on my way to primary school in Canoole, marvelled at the golden eye ducks who were driving, diving into the treacherous tidal waters, searching for mollusks and food. I always loved the three-dimensionality of scuba diving, and this is an attempt at an underwater sculpture of the golden eye searching for food. It has rather a chunky meniscus, though, and the wall behind the sculpture is part of Perth's flood defences, because the Tay can be as shallow as the sculpture depicts at low tide, as far inland as Perth, or knee-deep in the streets beside the sculpture. I believe the Tay has more water passing through it every day than the Thames and Severn combined, I can't remember what the source is, but I'm happy to believe it. Just to name drop, I went to the same schools as Souter, Craigie Primary around the corner from his house in Wilson Street, which is now a museum and art centre with a right room residence, and also to Perth Academy. In 1941, he wrote the poem, Ne Day Se Dark. <coughs> uh, that's quite short. So, Ne Day Se Dark, Ne Wud Se Bear, Ne Grun Se Stur Be Stain, But Licht Comes Through, A Sang Is There, A Glint of Grass Is Green. Who has not told his thought and hours in Kent when they were by, the tenderness of life that flowers, rock fast in misery. When I was researching him, I was able to withdraw his book from poems from the library, and it was signed. I found it really very hard to put it back, but I did, after I found <coughs> the signature. Uh, he obviously used what we used to call a mapping pen and ink to write. It was tiny, and I stuck it on the inside of my anthology, which I recommend. Leaving the fair city of Perth, uh, let's go to Hendon uh, in Barnet, in London, at the Five Roads roundabout, where the A1 from Scotland passes over a dangerous junction, which is part of a major traffic camming scheme with computer-generated traffic lights to stagger the traffic. I entered for a competition, uh, this is my idea, and won. It's a traffic jungle. The lines are mounted on stainless steel pillars, the same diameter as the street signage, so drivers can see past them. And this is the vis visibility envelope. Sorry, this visibility envelope uh, is not like to close shut, as planners speak, for being able to see through it. Uh, so much traffic passes through <coughs> that even in time, even in the time I worked there, lives were saved. It's called civic pride because it's a pride of lands, and a civic pride is what we get for, for in public art. Seamus would have got the pun. The lines are level with the school buses' windows and scare the pants off passing kids. <laughs> when we were uh, installing, I was crawling around in the foundations, quite far down, tightening the fixings. A passing man stopped for a blether. He was a Scottish lorry driver, a way to pick up his truck. He looked at the lines, and then he looked me and Brian from the foundry down in the foundations. 
That's great, he says. But I went to Canton and made that. I sit like him coining it. <laughs> yeah, no, he is then. He's in this hole with skint knuckles and a spanner. Anyway, St. Mal died. Uh, St. Mal died. Uh, roamed Ireland looking for a place to build a monastery. And when he came to Castle Blaney in County Monaghan, he found the perfect site beside what is now called Loch Murkville, Loch of the Pig. He saw a pig swimming in the loch and pronounced it was a miracle because pigs can't swim. <coughs> According to Meldoy, I think they'd float. <laughs> no, what fat. Anyway, legend has it that every night after a day's work in the monastery, the pig would come around and knock down the stonework. So with the help of my fabricator, Callum McPherson in Springfield and Fife, he welded up the stainless steel diving robot pig, which was shipped off to County Monaghan, where the sun always shines. Right, after time I've been there. Uh, and he looks down on the N2 highway. Uh, it's a wee bit far out. It, it, it's, it would have been there, it's completely diminished by the landscape. <clears throat> Again in the County Monaghan, in the Republic of Ireland, on the same N2 near Carrick Macross, the Patrick Cavanaugh way begins, uh, with my sculpture, where my sculpture uh, was installed there. Cavanaugh was criticised, sorry, criticised the Catholic Church and priests for banning dances, which occurred spontaneously at crossroads or in people's barns. Come dance with Kitty Stobling is one of such poem, and it is frankly surrealism in poetry. For instance, three of the lines read thus, trees walking across the crest of hills, and my rhyme cavorting on mile-high stilts, and the unnerving crowds looking up with terror in their rational faces. So I made these three figures dancing a precarious reel of three on stilts at the crossroad. They're supposed to look as if they're falling off. <laughs> Scottish poets feature in my work a lot, so here you get a bog off. Buy one, get one free. <laughs> the bust is my favourite Scottish poet, Norman McCaig, and I have his anthology at my bedside. Seamus he knew him well, and the quote on the anthology from him says, For me, McCaig is poetry. The other sculpture st sticks to the theme of still moving, which I try to. Uh, Robert Ferguson is striding down the Canongate, or maybe he's taking his book back to the Scottish Library, which is just <laughs> across the road. Yeah. Or maybe he's looking for a bonnie lass, <coughs> or both. Um, he has been removed for refurbishing at the moment to repair his varicose veins. <laughs> Uh, he was a major influence and inspiration to Burns because he wrote in Scots and it gave Burns the incentive to use Scots and he never looked back. Ferguson died aged 24 in abject poverty in Bedlam. The most recent theory about the cause of death came from the retired surgeon and expert on Scots poets, Professor David Purdy. He says Ferguson probably died of exposure because the cells were bare and unheated. I mean, aged 24. Uh, this tiny scribble, if you can see it, uh, uh, is the only idea I could get from a group of school kids with learning behavioural difficulties in Wishaw. I worked in three schools, so I designed three elements <coughs> representing them and a reprobate carting, cartwheeling through them. Because he was upside down, I modelled his head on an armature, the right way up. I spun him round the whole thing and he bashed his face on the support. <laughs> so things don't always go well. I got him right eventually, and he is mounted, of all places, for the school kids, in a pub outside Wishaw. <laughs> uh, I like the three-dimensionality of this composition. As you walk around it, it changes shape um, from, a, from a tunnel, from a diamonds into a tunnel. And the kids all got a day out for the unveiling. Poole in Dorset has a strong historic links with Newfoundland cod industry. Uh, I designed the ribs of a boat with a dancer describing the ribs. The poet James Wilkes was a lovely poem to go with it, and we had a lovely day at the unveiling. Back to Ireland again. I made this figure behind the greyhound for a sculpture in Carlo. And incidentally, the dog was Debo, J.K. Rowling's rescue dog, her husband commissioned me to make for her for her birthday quite a long time ago. Deirdre Brennan, the Irish poet in Carlo, wrote me a lovely poem which is inscribed on the ark, held up by the struggling man. This was installed in Carlo when the Celtic <coughs> tiger was in full swing and there were fantastic marble clad developments going up everywhere. It's a beautiful town with a seriously crazy hit, uh, history and a network of canals and lots of swans in them. Um, I had great adventures there too. I tried to smuggle my old dog Alf 
into my room in a pub and got caught on CCTV. What an idiot. <laughs> but Alf, so Alf was banished to the truck. This is destined for Tondi, the most deprived town I've ever worked in, in South Wales, in fact, in, anywhere. Uh, it used to have an iron works for making steam engines and, and with access to iron and coal. The buildings are nearly all ugly, but it has a thriving, very positive population and a brilliant new secondary school. It's Welsh English, and the school is called Ithedwerin, which I think means the oak. Um, I worked in the school with an award-winning Welsh poet, Irene Edwards, doing workshops and stuff, and used her dog in the sculpture because the kids wanted a dog. That's a good reason. Uh, her, here's her poem. The primal coal still mold, smoulders in the pupil of the eye that blinks our colourless to ash. The brick, the brick is freckled in the skin, a jigsaw wall of cells that armours and embraces as we stride and forge ahead. The iron can be mined from the crimson of our blood, the metal is that of aspiration, galvanising these hearts of steel. It's quite an abstract piece, I think. I made two kids and a dog fooling around uh, in, in the playground, and the founder cast them all at once. And so this is what bronze looks like uh, before it is patinated to fix the colour. Pity it doesn't stay that way. Anyway, uh, Rian's, um, Rian's poem is inscribed on the pillars in Welsh on one side and English on the other. And I got my fabricator to weld them up so that one pillar that the kids had bumped into looked knocked squint, or as he described it, on the pish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in May 2022, uh, I was flown out to Rochester in New York State to install my sculpture of Philip Seymour Hoffman. I had worked with a great team of technicians who had no rules regarding health and safety. <clears throat> John Ortiz, uh, some of you may have heard of him, and a fairly famous actor, of the Labyrinth Theatre Company in New York, worked with Philip Seymour Hoffman, and he was Othello to Phil's Iago. <coughs> he gave a truly moving speech and showed his love, as American actors do, and I got a hug too. <laughs> uh, in fact, everybody got a hug. Uh, it is relevant uh, to talk about this because he is still moving. He was such a chameleon of an actor, it's hard to pinpoint how to portray him, so I shot him shot from the hip. <coughs> I also, because he was walking around the corner with his script and his bag to the Dryden Theatre and the George Eastman Museum uh, in Rochester, still moving to the movies. <clears throat> it is also moving because his mother came along with his sisters, which is a very important endorsement for me. She was, it took some persuading, but she came and she was very happy with it. Right, here we go. <clears throat> in 1878, <clears throat> Mr. Jameson the Draper for the commission. The polar bear was brought to Dundee by whalers as a sideline for selling to zoos. He was probably a cub taken from his mother who was probably shot. When his crate was lowered onto the quayside it broke and he escaped up Commercial Street and turned left into the high street causing panic everywhere. While he stared at himself in the giant mirror in the draper's shop which is still there, it's, 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 um, it's a, a gift shop now, uh, the crew came in and captured him and took him back. So I modelled him in clay, um, and it's just a, it's a lovely scale to work on. But we had a quandary. How do we elevate the sculpture to a suitable level for viewing? I suggested all sorts of stone tables and things, but John Gray, arts officer, came up with an idea. Why not an iceberg? And we could reverse the roles. So the oddly named Bruin gets his revenge as the iceberg melts and he attacks humanity. 
Thank you, John Ray, for all your work in Dundee Public Art Programmes, and thanks also to Bob McGilvery, who drove it from the start. <clears throat> Tilly Drone District in Aberdeen sits in a great setting, right on the River Don. At one time, there were five paper mills along the river, exploiting the power of water and its availability to make paper for the, new, for the newspaper industry and packaging and everything else. There was only one, there's only one left now, um, further upstream. As a result, of the river has been cleaned up, and it's a hive of nature. Ospreys, kingfishers, all sorts of ducks, swans and otters have moved back to reclaim the river. Some, are very some very enterprising locals got together and installed their own electricity generating turbine. It's quite an amazing thing. Tully Drone Gateway organised a competition uh, for public artists to try and link the past industry with the present flourishing wildlife. Now, I was always daft on origami and flying swans, two things. Now, we light bulb went on in an empty crevice in my brain. <laughs> origami, swans, paper and nature, no brainer, they need, but they need to be in flight. So I cheated and had them fabricated by Callum McPherson and the team in Springfield. Things have hiccuped a bit. Uh, and Springfield, and these, these could be described as kirigami. In origami, you're not meant to cut the paper. In kirigami, you can. It's not quite a, a Mybridge freeze, uh, or freeze frame, it's more like a fly-past of stealth bombers. Um, <laughs> such is the enthusiasm of the team, they went on to find funding for other runners-up. Uh, they were an amazing team, they were working in a community with many problems, but it was seriously a good learning curve for me to go into the schools and the community hub and work with the locals. The city of Leicester, uh, one year, one year long, long ago, won all three national trophies in rugby, cricket and football. This was the maquette for my submission for the commission to celebrate the triumph. It is three kids celebrating the exuberance that comes with good health and fitness and, and presenting, uh, representing the sports. It lost and the piece that won was ghastly. But I don't mind losing too much if the winner is better, but really, that was appalling. <laughs> the Kingsway West Park was just being built and Dundee Public Art Programme, bless their socks, were looking for ideas and I resuscitated the tumblers and got to, and got to make them. They were mounted on a waterfall which lit up at night. Lighting and a waterfall, one immediately thinks, what about maintenance? When the waterfall worked, it was great and atmospheric and added to the sense of risk. I thought the whole effect worked well. And it did, <coughs> but the owners have neglected it. And as one by one the retail outlets go under, the whole retail park gets run down. The sculpture now is covered in grime, and the pond full of litter, and the occasional supermarket trolley, and the water and lights went off long ago. But they're still moving. Uh -huh. Right. <coughs> now, this is the difficult bit. It says here to wing it. <laughs> so, uh, expect waffle. Um, this is Rory Gallagher, who, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Hendrix was asked, what's it like to be the greatest guitarist in the world? And Rory, uh, he replied, ask Rory Gallagher. So he was born in Bally Shannon in 1948, same year as me, and he, he, he did become one of the greatest guitarists ever, and, and singers, I mean, and also he composed quite a lot of his own music. So they wanted to make a, a, a sculpture of him in Valley Shannon. So uh, this is to take you through the casting process, which you probably all know. Anyway, um, I made, uh, I've got an articulated armature, which can be anyone. Uh, it's, I've still got the same ar armature, and he's become Neil Gow the Fiddler, and Scott Skinner the Fiddler, and um, various other reprobates. Uh, I had to make the guitar in plaster, because it was slightly bigger than life scale. So, it gradually starts slapping on this refined mud called clay, and that's, that's it gradually accumulating. This was a long time ago, by the way, you can tell. Uh, and uh, as it accumulates, you start to get the hands to wrap around the guitar and actually hold it properly until you get the finished clay piece. Now, that's, for me, that's the easy bit. Uh, and I then hand that over to the foundry. The, the Barry O'Neill, the councillor, came over from Bally Shannon, had a look at it, approved it, so we went on to casting. So the first thing the foundry does is to paint it with silicon. Now silicon is as expensive as uh, bronze by weight, but they don't use it quite so much. 
So they gradually cover it in silicon, and it's, it's a bit like margarine, um, and it gradually gets thicker and thicker. And then when you stop to read the sun and eat your crisps, <laughs> you can see that he's putting plaster jackets around each, each part of the moulds and dividing them up into little horizons so that they can be cut off and moved. So he, um, th that's his head removed. So you can see that's the moulds inside out. So it's actually a, a complete negative of the, the, the clay. Um, that we'll take that to Edinburgh and hose it out the clay and then clean it up and then the process carries from there. But that's, that's floppy silicon inside two plaster jackets and the jackets keep the shape so that they, they, they can cast it from there. So that, that they take all the, 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 the molds off, take them away to Edinburgh and I get the clay back. So the clay that made him is still making stuff today. It's the only part of the process that fully recycles. Um, they then make a wax cast of the, the figure and various parts of it um, and they then cover it, them, uh, cover it you can, a weak point over here, they cover it <laughs> in uh, small um, nails like a voodoo doll because there's an inner core. The nails go right through the, the, the wax into the inner core and then they cover that again with more stuff. This, um, it's called an investment, this fireproof material. Also you can see there's runners, these, these, these long uh, rods of, of wax. They're, they're there to, once they've melted and they've gone away, they allow the gases to escape and allows the, the whole of the bronze to flow right through the mold. So here, here's Yvonne in the finery slapping on more of this fireproof material to his, I think it's his legs or something. And then the, these molds go into a kiln for about two, at least two days at about 600 degrees centigrade. And the wax evaporates or it pours out the bottom. You then get uh, a crucible heated up full of molten bronze and you do a little pour. <laughs> They then dig up the moulds, take a sledgehammer to them, I've seen them do it, they take a sledgehammer to them, smash off the, 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 the plaster the plast of investment, they also have to drill out all the investment that's on the inside, I mean it's a horrendous job, and then they've got all these pieces, it looks like um, a butcher's shop, so they, they, they then weld them back together and weld up a frame, uh, it's got the date on this, 2010, so that's really Rory being re-welded into shape as he was. And then they mount them up and patinate them. And the, the patination, again, is to capture the, uh, the, the bronze before the, the nature gets a hold of it and turns it all sorts of different colours. And the founder were quite clever. They used acrylics on the guitar so it looks like his actual guitar colours, which was always worn. It was part of his feature. So we pack them up, stick them in the back of a truck, and drove them over to Valley Shannon. And um, that's the arts officer there. And the, uh, the sun always shines and it's got to go. <laughs> Uh, it was a great day. This is his brother Donald uh, talking to RTE uh, about his brother and it was, it was such a lovely atmosphere the whole day and I got interviewed by RTE and this lady asked me, how do you go about doing this? Do you use videos or photos? He's dead. You know, do you use videos and, or photographs or what? I said, no, we dug him up and had a good look at him. <laughs> she said, cut, I can't broadcast <laughs> So there he is now, and it's, it's become an icon. So every year, uh, on the first uh, weekend in June, the long weekend, it's, the, the whole town is mobbed. And it, it, the, 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 and the fact that Rory was uh, born there actually means that, that the, the town has survived. And it's, it's, uh, you know, it saw itself through the, the, the major depression. Um, when everything went wrong. So that was good. Now, I should return to the script. <coughs> uh, I hope you are all still breathing, <laughs> and above all, still moving. Thank you, it says here. Say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so much that was fascinating and some amazing image there and it was great to see that whole process at the end there that was right. really really interesting so we have plenty of time for questions so folks i'm going to put the lights up does anyone have any
don't know, shout at once. <laughs> well, let me kick off, um, uh, David, by asking you, it would be great to hear a bit more about your, your time at the college and what your memories of that are, and what it taught you and didn't uh, teach you. Well, it's a bit like the 60s, you know, if you were there and remember it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, was, it was great fun, actually, and I, I got to go on and teach at the college for a year, um, and that was, that was interesting. And uh, it, it, I realised then that I was probably out of my depth, that was not uh, academic material. So that uh, then went back over onto St Saviour's uh, teaching there for um, 14 years, I think, before I eventually took the plunge. It's mainly because we had kids, so I became a house husband. Um, but uh, our college days were, were, were great. It was, it was work hard and play hard, I think that's what went on in, in, in Dundee. Because everybody did work hard and play hard. How, I'm interested in how you get into public art. I you know, as, a, as an artist, do you have to kind of bid all the time? Yes, well, it, it varies there, quite a bit, a but mainly there's uh, commissions that are advertised, and you answer the advertisement, and then you submit ideas, which it can be quite annoying that they ask for ideas without any payment, mm -hmm. um, and they, you know, they ask for ideas up front, but that happens quite a lot, but then they, they'll, then they'll have a shortlist, you'll be elected onto a shortlist if you're lucky, and it might be three, it might be six, which is pain, you know, because uh, five of you are wasting your time. Uh, um, but it's, it's, so it's quite uh, arduous. Um, and then you may eventually get around to getting on with it. It's, so it's quite, quite, it always takes ages to get going. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you get it by word of mouth. Um, but usually if it's from public funds, then it has to go to tender. And the tendering process now is, is getting more and more thorough. And uh, it's just a minefield. In fact, it's one of the reasons that John Gray decided to completely retire, because he just got fed up with the tendering process. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is difficult. Um, and it's also, usually at, at the beginning, it's like the equity uh, card for actors. You've got to have some experience to get the job. Mm -hmm. you know, and you've got to be an actor acting to get the job, to get the equity card. But you can't get the job if you haven't got the equity card. There's a catch-22 there. Definitely. So is there a course? Would you, you know? Well, I think, think there is now. Yes, yeah, I think there is now. Uh, there was one run for a while at an art college by people who hadn't done any public art. I think. No <laughs> 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 Um Yes. A favourite piece that you've created. A favourite. Yes. Well, that's one of them. Uh, and also, um, Pat here owns it. One of the other ones, which is. Uh, a little bar now, um, which I made a long time ago, because it's, it's, it's one of the things, like, with Seamus Heaney's poems, it's the simplest thing that's so hard to get, to edit it down to simplicity. Uh, and the, the, the bar now that, that Pat's got is, is just right down to simplicity. Um, and it, it works. So, yeah, yeah, that's what you try to achieve, anyway. It's like, it's like the poems. It's like trying to, you know... <clears throat> Why use 500 words when you can use one? <laughs> yes? If Dundee City Council came to you with lots of money and said, would you please make a sculpture, a public art, that encapsulates Dundee, what would you do? Well, you're asking ideas up front with that. Yes, I don't know. It's, 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 it's very hard. I mean, it's, a lot of the public art in Dundee is actually encapsulated it already with, it, with it, you know, all the cartoons and things. And the, the one I did in the Polar Bear was actually uh, trying to pay tribute to Dudley Watkins. So it was, it was actually a three-dimensional cartoon of, of, uh, of that's that guy's expression. Um, just sheer horror of the Polar Bear. Yeah, if you want to say a bit about the, the two other Dundee pieces that you didn't mention. So first of all, there was the Cat's Poem that Bertie Ferry maybe. <laughs> So you can about that, your cat's poem. Oh yes, the, 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 the sculpture library. of the Bright Fader Library, but I've forgotten about that. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's, it's actually like, uh, based on my grandfather, but he's sitting reading a book of poems. Uh, by, one was by A.S.J. Tessament, um, and it's about um, a cat. I think it's called The Cat in the Moon, I'm not sure. Anyway, um, he's reading this poem in the book. I think, that, I think it's, uh, I actually cast it in resin and uh, put the poem and printed the poem and covered it in a sheet of resin, but I think it's been burned off with cigarette stubs and things. But um, the cat is coming along the back of the bench and interrupting him reading about the poem, and he's looking irritated about it. It's, uh, yeah, um, 
Yeah. Yeah. And the other one was the, your, your uh, boxes outside the Tesco's and South Road. Oh God, yeah. Well, which has yeah. got another great yeah. poem. There's, a, there's a super poem um, by Bill Herbert, Professor Bill Herbert of Newcastle University, who was born in Lockheed. And I did the sculpture outside Lockheed. It's, it's a bit of a state of disrepair now as well. Mm. But, um, it's a series of packages tumbling out of, uh, in, in a, a, a helical curve coming down a banking. It's supposed to be, and he calls it, the, the poem's called The Messages, which is quite a Scottish way of talking about going shopping. Mm -hmm. You know, good for the messages. And it's, it's written in Dundonian. And it, he managed to slip in the line, sees twa brides and a ninganine and all. It's <laughs> <laughs> you know, classic. So it's, it's nice to have that in, in print on sculpture. That would help, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yes. yes, sir. Are you ever worried about the reception you might get? Sorry? Are, are you ever worried about the reception your sculptures would get? From yes. Like oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, there was, I put one in uh, outside. Um, or it was in, um, in the Wirral. I've forgotten the name of the town. Um, Hoylake. And it's all the sculpture there in the roundabout. And I had a bit of bother with it. And uh, I went back. And a woman came out one day and said to me, uh, Have you got a monstrosity in your back yet? <laughs> <laughs> So I said, well, I do actually. <laughs> got a life size pig in the garden. And that was. And I was. Another, I, I, ages and ages ago, I was working on a piece of sculpture up in uh, Fraserburgh, installing it, and it was called the net. And it's uh, a net, a fishing net, but it's a net made of fish. So the, swiss, the, the fish are swimming as if you're on the seabed, and the fish are swimming in a, in a, a, a spiral forming the shape of a net with two big skates swimming vertically to form the cord, you know, the cord ends, the, the flaps that, that uh, a trawler has. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, this was before the days of health and safety. And there were, once or twice there were people who had clearly been released into the community prematurely. <laughs> they come wandering under the crane while we were lowering it. We weren't wearing hard hats. <laughs> you know, the, uh, this person would say, what's this? You know, and then and, and all, once it was installed, this lady came past and said, what is that? And I said, well, if you imagine you're on the seabed and the fish are swimming in the formed shape of, of a, a, a net, and it's, and it's also the, the names of all the, fit, the fish in Scots are engra engraved on the stone. Oh, it's a monstrosity. <laughs> so I rather sarcastically said, thank you very much. And she said, oh, did you make it? I said, yes. I said, oh, it's quite nice, actually. <laughs> so I thought then, with public art, you've got to, to it happens now, you know, by the book now, you've got to carry people with you from the start. Mm -hmm. So that a lot of it, you go out to the public first, to find out what they want. I did that until they drone. God, it's hard work. <laughs> but, um, and the same in Wales. Um, in several places in Wales, I went uh, out to, uh, to schools. Uh, at Bridge End, that was a great experience uh, with a good outcome. I haven't shown that because it's still, it's not moving. Um, and, uh, but the, the one in Tondi, which is just up the valley from Bridge End, uh, that was the, the school there was terrific, absolutely terrific. So that, that you've got to carry on with you first. Yes. Is there a piece of public art that really impresses you, or what's well, your other opinion? than mine? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, the whale in Dundee. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that's magnificent. Um, and the, the chat that made it is going to be making some more stuff for uh, the, the walk between Monty yes. Feath and yes. uh, um, was it, what, uh, Bright Ferry Monty Feath. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so that's, that's, that's a fantastic thing. Um, I'm trying to think of something else. Um, Kenny, Kenny Hunter, uh, who again uses the same foundry as me, he's, he's done some wonderful stuff all over the country. He's got a, a reclining figure at uh, Aberdeen University in the grounds there. And the wonderful new COVID memorial sculpture at Surgeon's Hall. Oh, yes, I have. Yeah, I haven't That's seen really, that yet. Yeah, really yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. No, he's, he's sound. Any more? Is there anywhere in Dundee you'd like to see? Where would you think would be good to see something? Else. Something it's, else. It's full of them. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> barely, them. Barely any room for, <laughs> for art. <laughs> Which thing would be really good to have something? Another, another new piece by something? Where? Yeah. I don't know. Um, I, it's such a changing place now, isn't it? Uh -huh. Maybe, I tell you what, I, I, for a long time I looked into the idea of doing Billy McKenzie of the Associates with his two whippets. 
uh, and uh, you've got the ideas there, uh, but there's no money for it. And, uh, but I think if you could make one a piece like that that was actually movable, it could go in the Slesser Gardens, mm -hmm. uh, and then when, when, when there was a bit, when there, an event happening, uh, and the roads get blocked as ever, uh, they, they, they could move it away and um, you know, do some. Yeah, that I think that'd be quite a nice thing because he was wonderful, mm -hmm. quite a unique voice. I used to see him walking up and down uh, mm -hmm. um, Princess Street in Dundee. Do you remember him? Is there any place in the world that you would like to put a sculpture that you haven't already been to? Oh, God. I'd have to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> put the sculpture where I haven't been. Yeah. Like Australia or something. Where would you like a free holiday, basically? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, the, the experience of going to uh, Rochester was great. Um, and, you know, you do get treated well in America. It's, uh, that was, that was just fantastic. Um, I don't know, maybe, I don't know about Australia, uh, maybe Japan, but they're so much better at everything. <laughs> so, you know, if you're out of class, really. <coughs> things are changing too, you know, because uh, with 3D printing coming in, the, the, this casting process is, is actually um, becoming a bit Neolithic almost. You know, it's, it's, it's Iron Age stuff rather than what's happening now in casting. It's, qu it's quite different. And, um, you know, we're getting done out of a business. Um, but the founder are quite, uh, they're quite aware of that, and they, they realise that if they stick to the way they do it, that, that people will keep coming back to it, but probably on a smaller scale. I mean, there, there's a huge founder in England that, that does 3D printing on a massive scale. It's very expensive. It's really expensive. And it's not, it's not good for the planet. Um, none of the casting that I get done is good for the planet at all. So, um, Happy to wind down quite soon. Um, and, uh, wallow in guilt. <laughs> Are you doing something at the moment? I'm just doing a neighbour's bust. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm waiting for one to the go ahead for a, a nice commission at St Andrews. But that's some, still some judice. Um, it's there, but, um, and the funding's there, but it's uh, trying to get planning permission at St Andrews is uh, quite tricky. <laughs> Sure, do. Sorry. How do you feel about uh, sculptures today being torn down due to current thinking and political correctness? Yeah, well, there are mixed feelings about that because I, I think uh, they are actually on a record of how bad the history was, and so that that should be um, written on it. Uh, you know, it should, they should change the plaque. Like, can, I mean, to take down Dundas. Uh, in Edinburgh, for instance, would, be, would cost too much for a start, and it would be, uh, be really difficult. So they should just write the story at the bottom of how he made his money. Um, <coughs> Which they have done. They have done, <laughs> yeah. yeah but but, but uh, somebody, uh, the family moved in and took away, <laughs> took away the plaque. Um, I had to, uh, I, had to say, uh, I, I made Baden Powell uh, on the, the um, on Pool Harbour, and there was a movement afoot uh, from the Black Lives Matter. Uh, to have it torn down uh, because Powell was a racist and that's, uh, that is a fact because he was in the Boer War and, you know, and he was known for abusing uh, black prisoners uh, so not giving them food and keeping the food for his troops but it was, uh, it was a thing of his era but then he went on to find one of the one, most wonderful brotherhoods in, in the world that, can, that brought more and more people together and I, I count myself amongst that because uh, it, it taught us in the, the, the early 60s, the, how awful racism was. And uh, <coughs> so the Scouts were a great movement. But you know, if they tried, the, the, the council decided in Pool that they would move the sculpture themselves before it was thrown in the, ha in the harbour. So they, they, they tried to move it, but they discovered that the fixings I use would lift the harbour. <laughs> <laughs> so they couldn't move it. And uh, so they, uh, but then it, it got this. Uh, entourage of uh, 60 to 70 year olds boy scouts dressed in uniform sat around it and, and held this um, vigil all night so they, uh, to look after it and then eventually I think they boarded it up but it's still there but I think you know it's, that should be mentioned too that, that he, he was his, his role in history that, that he did do these awful things in South Africa <coughs> and had these awful opinions but they were, most of the people then did 
Um, I don't, I don't, uh, you know, but a lot of people didn't. A lot of people were quite enlightened, like Wilberforce. So, you know, keep them as a record. <coughs> You showed a, a pig earlier, I know the pig's kind of your, your trademark. Yeah, no, yeah well, um, that, that, our house, when we, when we bought the land and built the house in it uh, about, um, over 40 years ago, um, the, the, there was a post office was still working in Kilmeny and it was run by a lady in her 90s and she sold stamps and tablet. And that was that. And it took you half an hour to buy a stamp, but you get the history of the, the area. Uh, and I won't go into that because it's, it's, it's incredible. But anyway, I asked her what the land was called across the road. And she said, We, I cried it, the pig's crave. I said, What's that? I said, You don't care. A pig's crave is a pigsty. A crave is a, like a creel or an enclosure. And we had pigsties where your house is now. So we called it Pig's Grave Cottage. And then uh, that, that sort of stayed with us. And then uh, when my little girls, um, and it was sort of about three or four, we used to drive over to Bonmolo to get the Sunday papers. And there was a pig farm there. And we'd go and feed the pigs crisps. Uh, I, uh, and so Amy loved the pigs. So I came home and I made a pig in the garden. And um, it was actually a godsend. Because during lockdown, there was nothing happening. I got an email from a guy in Sark saying, I do love your Sal. That's how his email went. But anyway, so how much for what I copy of it? I said, well, I need to get the foundry onto that. So I got the foundry to price it. They said 25,000 for to cast a life-size pig. Right, OK, I'll take five. So I went back to the guy and said, 30,000. I said, that's fine, just get it done. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that helped me through lockdown quite a bit. And do you still sign your work for the wee pig? No, I don't. No, that was. It's funny. I used to put a little frog on the. Uh, mm. hide it somewhere, a frog in a lily. Just to, like. Um, what's his name? Chippendale used to put a little mouse somewhere mm. on the things. So I, I used to do that. And, um, uh, I, I just throw it away, but I stamped it on things for quite a while. And then, I was installing the deer in Dundee. Um, these guys were walking past and they said, do you sign this? I said, yes. If you look on the testicles of the rear deer, you'll see a little frog. I said, nah, you just, you're just taking the mickey. You just want me to go and look at his balls. <laughs> so I said, hey, look, this! There's, there's a frog there, and a lily. And, you know, it's been vandalized, and it's no longer there. So yes, I did spend some time looking for it once. <laughs> 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 it's all, it's all right. I wish I could take life a bit more seriously. <laughs> Best not to, I think. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, well, I think we've had a fantastic evening. You will agree with some great images, but also a really fantastic talk as well. So if you just join me in thanking David once again. <laughs>